So the economic crisis that falls uh, on the world in the 1920s and the 1930s has pretty significant political impacts as well. Um, so to the eyes of many, Western civilization by the 1930s has essentially failed. Um, we talked about in the previous lecture how many people become disillusioned after World War I with the idea of this superior, enlightened Western culture that this supposedly this superior race and these superior people and their superior way of life basically plunged the entire world into war and brought all of the death and destruction of industrialized weapons and warfare upon the entire eastern hemisphere and that disillusionment is further intensified in the 20s and 30s as essentially the backbone, the economic backbone of Western society, which is free market laissez-faire capitalism, basically implodes upon itself. And these enlightened democratic governments in Western Europe and the United States have seemingly no answers to fix the economic crisis that they face. They react very, very slowly um as is the way with democratic governments things take time compromises must be made uh cooperation and collaboration and meetings and votes and things must take place and bills must be passed into law etc 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 so basically in the late 1920s and early 1930s many people feel as if they are looking at the end of enlightened Western civilization. And with capitalism imploding and democratic governments unable to stop it, this leads a lot of people who are in serious economic poverty, who are desperately searching for ways to regain their lifestyle, in some cases, find places to live, find jobs, find ways to put food on the table and food in their family's mouths, they begin to seek out political solutions that are non-democratic. And this leads to the rise of what we call totalitarian governments. And these totalitarian governments in the 1920s and 1930s promise quicker, and easier solutions to the economic crisis of the Great Depression, as well as the restoring of national and, and ethnic pride, right? So totalitarianism is a government that seeks full control over every aspect of its citizens' lives, okay? Um, totalitarianism is essentially absolute government on steroids. Um, not only does it direct all political decisions, it also directs every aspect of economic life. In some cases, they set prices, they set wages. Um, some governments are, you know, some totalitarian governments are socialistic or communistic, meaning that it's a fully planned economy. But beyond just that, it also seeks full social control over their citizens. It seeks to control their decision making and it seeks to control the methods in which they express themselves culturally as well, right? So, in a totalitarian government, the individual is subordinate to the needs of the state, okay? And what this means is that your individual wants and desires, which under, you know, democratic laissez-faire capitalism come first and foremost, right, are basically made secondary to what's more beneficial to the needs of essentially the greater good, okay, the needs of the state. Um, now, in order to get people to buy into this, most of these totalitarian governments use wide-scale propaganda in order to influence personal beliefs, in order to influence and convince people 
that in order to save themselves and in order to dig themselves out of the situation that they find themselves in, they need to willingly sacrifice their own needs, their own wants, and their own desires to conform to this bigger idea, this idea of the state and the power of the state and how the state is bigger and better than themselves as the individual. And that if they're willing to give up a portion or in some cases all of that individual freedom and those individual rights, that the state will provide for them, that the state will pull them out of the economic crisis that they face, that it will be able to put food on the table, it'll be able to get them a job, it'll be able to bring back the good times. And for a lot of people in Western Europe, as well as elsewhere in the world, this is a decision that they're willing to make. Um, and it's easy to look in hindsight at how horrific some of these governments are and the massive abuse of power that these totalitarian governments um, enact on their own population. But at the same time, when you have a family to feed and your children and your wife and in some cases more than one generation, parents and grandparents included, are living on the street and don't have food and don't have a safe place to sleep. A lot of these political concerns and the idea of individual freedom and, you know, free speech and unlawful search and seizure, et cetera, et cetera, all become kind of minor concerns in the face of bigger, more pressing problems. Now, in a lot of these totalitarian governments, um, there are multiple methods by which this level of control is enforced. Um, in a lot of cases, you will see changes gradually over time in the law, things that are aimed at more collective thinking and collective action. You'll see the reduction of individual freedoms and individual rights as well. Um, generally in a totalitarian state, the government controls all sources of media, radio, television, movies, print media, and they use that media as a weapon by which to influence the culture and the social life of their citizens. And there is this constant bombardment with state-centered propaganda, with ideas and songs and slogans that import upon people how important it is to conform to the idea of the state, that the state is what's going to save you from all of the chaos and all of the ruin that surrounds your life. And on a 24 hour bait on a 24 hour a day basis over a long enough period of time, many people start to buy into this idea that their own individual wants and needs will be better served if they give up their freedom and they give up their individualism in terms of working towards the collective good of the state. Now, one of the most common factors in the rise of totalitarian governments is the use of fear and the use of terror to silence any opposition to the state. So in order to pursue a fully unified state and population, there can be no opposition and no criticism of the state. And in most of these totalitarian governments, it is violently suppressed. Um, political parties, other democratic institutions, um, voting rights, things like that are slowly but surely erased over time in order to further consolidate government control over all avenues of expression. Um, people who do oppose or resist this government usually will find themselves locked away in forced labor camps. Many of these totalitarian governments have secret prisons and secret court systems in which people are 
accused, tried, and convicted without due process, without any kind of legal representation. Um, many of these totalitarian governments have their own secret police force um, with which they carry out this kind of campaign of terrorism against their own people. And essentially what it does is it creates an unspoken atmosphere of daily fear of standing out. Um, it creates a daily fear of being seen as an individual rather than part of that state. And when the safety of yourself personally and the safety of your family and those you hold dear is on the line, the majority of people are willingly and more likely to conform to the ideals of the state rather than risk death or injury to themselves and the loved ones. And those that are willing to stand up against it are usually subjected to what is essentially state-run terrorism. They are terrorized by their own government. Now, the reason that the depression is able to pull people towards this strong authoritarian, basically absolute government is because these types of governments offer much quicker and much easier solutions to the economic problems of the 1920s and the 1930s. Um, in Germany, for example, once Adolf Hitler is appointed chancellor for life, um, he quickly starts doing away with many of the democratic institutions of the Weimar Republic. And many people protest this. But what he also does is he creates one of the most massive economic turnarounds in world history. Um, he takes the German financial system, which is absolutely destroyed by the 1930s, with raging debts to foreign banks, um, massive war debts to all of the Allied powers, and he essentially refuses to pay them. He essentially wipes the slate clean in Germany, creates a new German currency, um, completely eradicates the currency of the previous government, eradicates all of those debts, and immediately gets German people back to work by massive investment in infrastructure, roads, canals, bridges, things like that. He also begins rebuilding the German military, which provides millions of jobs serving in the military, as well as millions of more manufacturing jobs producing for that military. So totalitarian governments, although they, be, they try to erase individualism and individual rights and individual freedoms, they are more well equipped to deal with an economic crisis like the Great Depression than a democratic style government. Because in a totalitarian government, there is one single person or one single group of people making all of the decisions. And those decisions can be made instantaneously. There is no need for committees. There is no need for government voting. There is no need for long processes of bills being passed into laws. When the government says this needs to get done, it gets done. Those that resist are eliminated, right? Um, another reason why these totalitarian governments are better equipped to deal with the crisis in the 20s and 30s is also because they bombard their population with this constant sense of reassurement that the state will provide, the state will eliminate your problems. If you submit to the state and you submit to the collectiveness and the collective good, all will be taken care of. And what ends up happening is this provides a level of comfort that most people haven't seen, especially in Western Europe, in well over a decade. And these totalitarian governments actually prove to be more effective than the democratic capitalist states when it comes to actually enacting real economic change and beginning to pull themselves out of the depression. So 
what we have here is some examples of what I'm talking about in terms of the constant bombardment of these totalitarian governments. The majority of the propaganda is, is centered on um, the collective work, right? The collectiveness of the family, the collectiveness and the security of tradition, right? Patriarchy, mom stays at home and raises the children. Dad goes out and works an honest day's living, et cetera, et cetera. Um, getting the people back to work, how working for the common good benefits all, you know, the, the phrase a rising tide raises all ships, right? And you see this essentially, you know, everywhere um, in these totalitarian governments, the promises of food, the promises of jobs, the promises of outcompeting your rivals um, in the democratic capitalist world and how the strength of the state is going to overpower the weakness of these individual capitalist societies. Now, one particular brand of totalitarian government is what's known as fascism. And fascism um, is a very important alternative in the 1920s and 1930s. Um, so fascism develops in Italy after World War I. Now, important distinction here. Fascism as a style or a method of government can be totalitarian, but it doesn't have to be totalitarian. Fascism, rather than focusing on absolute control over everyone's life, exploits national, ethnic, and in some cases racial pride in order to build support for the state and its programs, right? But it doesn't have to be totalitarian. So fascism, especially Italian and German fascism, uses nationalism as a tool to create enthusiasm for this government control. Um, all of the propaganda within a fascist government focuses on creating this unbreakable sense of national pride. And it's usually based on either cultural or ethnic or racial superiority. And <clears throat> many times it's connected to some, you know, idea of former past glory, right? And it creates this cult and this image of the people, right? Now, under totalitarian governments, everything is subordinate to the state. In fascism, everything is subordinate to the people or to the nation. Now, under fascism, the state exerts most of the control. They are the ones who, through the use of propaganda, define who the people are or who the nation is. And <clears throat> by doing this, they portray themselves as just an extension of the people. They don't control the people. They just do what's best in order to serve the people, right? And what this does by creating this sense of uber-nationalism is it connects the idea of the people or the nation and the state so that they are just simply seen as one. So what is good for the people, the citizens, is what is also good for the state. The two are, are inseparable, right? If the state fails, then it's because the people have failed. And if the people have failed, well, then they've let down the state and the state has let them down as well. So again, this easily leads to totalitarian control, but it doesn't have to be. Fascism is more based on this kind of hyper-nationalistic idea of the people literally are the living, breathing organs of the state. And the state just simply functions to better whatever end they need, right? Um, now, another aspect of fascism that is unique from totalitarianism, but doesn't have to be, there is some overlap, is the use of propaganda to create a kind of cult of leadership, right? Um, in these fascist states, the leader is not seen as 
a ruler per se, even though he has power, even though he enacts legislation, even though he enforces the law, makes decisions, again, he is simply seen as a tool of the people and of the state. He is just, he, he, he doesn't run the state, the state and the people run him. He is simply the instrument, he's the scalpel making the incision, or he's the hammer um, you know, shaping the iron, or he's the needle sewing, uh, you know, sewing the uniform or the clothing, right? He is portrayed only as a tool or a servant of the people. And he just simply knows what the will of the people is. And everything that they do is simply doing what is necessary and what is best for the people and for the state right and you see this in um you see this in nazi germany and you see this in fascist italy um in both places neither hitler or mussolini ever take on an official title right hitler is appointed chance of chancellor for life but he forgoes that title and is simply referred to as der führer or the leader so that way, there is no kind of supposition of power or of ruling over the people. Again, he is their tool. He works for them, right? And you can see this in all forms of Nazi and, and fascist propaganda, right? Um, the Nazis were especially good at this. You know, you can see in the one on the right, um, Hitler is seen as kind of this joyous father figure who relishes and you know playing with the german children and and molding the youth of germany um the one on the left here has some very like christian messiah symbolism going on here with you know the light breaking through the clouds and kind of the uh the angelic formation in the sky above hitler it gives this very kind of second coming of Jesus Messiah complex, right? Um, this idea that Hitler was sent. He didn't force his way to the top. He didn't, you know, struggle his way to the top. He just appeared when the people needed him in order to lead them into greatness.